another week. Tony Mulvey looks a lot different this week. A lot better hair. I'm not going <laughs> to lie. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd say he did get uh, some upgrades there. But Kaylee Nix uh, joining me today, filling in for the Tony Mulvey, who is in Ireland. Uh, so I guess it's evening there while we're doing this. But Zach Strickland, head of freight market intelligence at Freightways. This is Freightonomics. We are here to discuss that freight market and supply chain activity, as well as everything that's going on in the world. Now, this week, since Kaylee is able to join me, we're going to discuss the weather. And if you guys don't know, <laughs> Zach is a closet weather nerd. Oh. So uh, I don't even know if it's closet weather nerd. You called it out yeah. on stage at Future of Supply Chain oh, yeah. at the beginning of the month. So everybody knows that you love the weather. And I think everybody knows that I am a meteorologist by trade and yes. just need everything else by necessity, not necessarily by right. anything other than that. Um, but yeah, so we're going to get into it a little bit. And before we do that, I've got to ask Zach, Okay. Over under how many Guinnesses is Tony deep right now? Oh, I would say minimum seven. <laughs> minimum, I like that. Are they? They're yeah. about six uh, six hours ahead of us here, yeah. so about six p.m. there ish. There you go. All right. Yeah. Well, we'll have to we'll have yeah. to ask him about it. But but before we do that, I I'll lead you right into it because it's market in two time. Yeah, and no, normally Tony two. does this, but you can uh, get it started in three, two, one. All right. I don't know that they were ready for it. I don't know. We got There we go. All right. So now we'll start. Oh, try tender rejection index. Now, the fascinating thing to me about this index is how closely that white line is still following the orange line, which is the tender rejection index from 2019. Tender rejection index, of course, the rate at which carriers are rejecting loads from their contracted uh, accounts. They don't like to do this. And during the pandemic, we saw rejection rates. If you look at that green line there, we were coming out of the pandemic era. I removed the pandemic from this chart specifically because it noises it up. But we were seeing averages above 20%. We have been below 4 or 5% for the majority of the last year. That has changed. We are now starting to seeing some increasing responsiveness out of our tender rejection index, meaning that capacity is tightening, even though it's still relatively low, historically low, uh, below 6%. But Approaching the summer peak, which is always right around July 4th, we're seeing increasing responsiveness well above last year, which was almost a non-event. Uh, so tender rejection rates on the rise, probably going to, you know, I'll be interested to see what happens at July, after July 4th. Uh, do they fall uh, similarly to 2019 as well? Time will tell. Let's go to the next chart. NTIL, the national truckload excluding line haul or excluding uh, total cost of fuel estimated uh, on the spot market. This just helps us see what the spot rate is actually doing. Spot rates similar to 2019, but a little bit higher in terms of overall value or average. I don't think that's anything but a little bit of inflation. The direction itself, though, is showing an upward trajectory over last year, which is that light blue line. We are seeing some inflationary pressure, not a significant amount year over year, but we are seeing an uptick, increasing sensitivity on the spot market, just like the rejection rate. Let's go to the next chart, outbound tender volume index, looking at demand. Demand looks great. Uh, OTVI is actually on the rise. It's hitting its summer stride uh, there in June. It looks like, you know, maybe it will fall off in July as it seasonally does. Maybe we are entering a more seasonal period. Uh, time will tell on that, but demand looks relatively good. And last but not least, IOTI, maritime demand, spiking right before the peak. There we go. Do we, I mean, we love to see that, right? Craig Fuller posted yesterday on Twitter that July will be a huge tell. And obviously, July is like such a funky month yeah. for the majority of things. Uh, we'll see if it comes to fruition or not. And actually quoted Thomas Wasson, who posted a chart about drive in outbound tender rejection rates, saying that it's at their highest level since December of 2022. Thomas was pretty hype about this mm -hmm. on Loaded and Rolling this past week. Uh, so if you haven't watched that, go on over to Freightwaves YouTube to do so. But he's, he's excited. And when when Thomas is excited, you know that things Listen, are, are... It has been a boring <laughs> environment for, for a long time now in the freight space. Uh, I, and I say boring, it's it's relatively boring. There's been some supply chain stuff going on, especially in the maritime side. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know that I like that kind of not boring, but it is... This environment's been pretty flat because there's just so much capacity. Yeah. Uh, we are seeing capacity exit the market, though. I think two of the stories, I pulled up two stories today before we get into the, the meat of the situation. 
uh, for Newsonomics. The top one here, Texas-based U.S. Logistics Solutions files for bankruptcy liquidation. These stories are starting to show up a little bit more frequently. I'm not saying that we're seeing a huge amount of increases here, but um, just another example of we're still in a pretty exodus centric environment for carriers and capacity. Yeah. Clarissa Hawes, who is yeah. our investigative reporter at Freightwave, she writes about our bankruptcies, our liquidations, our closures pretty much exclusively. Yep. Her, she's been busy. Her yeah. fingers have been quite busy <laughs> on the keyboard. And we actually, both of these stories ended up breaking the internet for a little <laughs> bit this past weekend. This one dropped on, I think it was Saturday night. But seeing that bankruptcy liquidation, a, a statement and a spokesperson for Ten Oaks Group, who's the private equity firm who owned them, said that the company is deeply disappointed by the lender's sudden decision to cease further funding for U.S. logistics solutions, which leads us to ask, is this a trend that we continue to see? Not just the businesses themselves failing, but the financial backers of these businesses saying, hey, we no longer see this as a viable investment. We got to pull out. Yeah, it's it's interesting. The banks aren't necessarily well-versed in, in private equity groups. They're not necessarily well-versed in transportation industry. They're stuff. not used to the volatility of it, right? Yeah. Y you typically don't get a lot of experience in that sector. I mean, the, the finance sector in itself thrives off of numbers and dollars. They understand dollars very well. Uh, operational metrics, not a thing that they're very accustomed to analyzing. Um, and I think that's kind of been a criticism of private equity in the transportation space over several years, um, is that they struggle to understand it. And especially from the operation to, you know, one of my jobs back in the day was translating operational KPIs into financial figures. Mm -hmm. And that is a very challenging thing to do easily and concisely. So, you know, private equity backed, uh, you know, ownership in the transportation space, especially a trucking company, which yeah. is very salt of the earth. The ORs are super tight. I, I think that's one of the misconceptions with finance, with right. trucking, is that they think they can walk in there and find all these efficiencies that- Create like a financial institution, that that's not the case. Yeah, that operators don't already have. The trucking environment is- required to be efficient because it's so competitive. It is an extremely efficient market because of the level of competition. So for an equity company to come into a, an operator and tell them to cut costs that they haven't thought about is probably a little bit, and I'm not saying that that's what happened here, but that's kind of traditionally how equity groups roll is they come into a company, find efficiencies, you know, try to get it leaner, operating more effectively, but a lot of these operators are already doing all that they can. This is just yeah. a bad environment. <laughs> yeah, it's it's tough to to stay afloat here. Tough to stay afloat, and if you're not willing to make some changes or possibly put yourself up for sale, which I think goes into our uh, second or second story yeah. here, you're kind of in hot water. And this was really the news that broke the internet: mm -hmm. RxO purchasing Coyote. And when we Again, back hearkening back to future of supply chain when we had a representative from UPS mm -hmm. up on the stage and Craig kind of skirted around the question of what was happening with Coyote. Now we know why, because right. this news came down the pipeline two weeks later. Yeah. And this is a massive deal. I mean, it's not an, the biggest news of 2024. Yeah, it's, it's I, I think exits manifest themselves differently, like m a activity increasing consolidation is also a form of capacity reducing mm -hmm. in the transportation environment. And of course, this is 3PL brokerage. Uh, environment, which, you know, Craig and I have talked about a lot in the way that the rise of brokerages has actually helped sustain this oversupplied dynamic longer than we probably would have had, you know, probably 10 years ago. Almost, I feel like because it's easier mm -hmm. to open a brokerage than it is to enter as There's no barrier to entry. Yeah, there's, there's no there's, barrier to entry. I, I was talking to somebody about this the other day, like the, the cycle for brokerages, and this is different than this story specifically, but appears to be, and this is something that Basco Majors pointed out in this article, uh, you get into a brokerage, you grow your portfolio, you leave. You take <laughs> well, it with you. Yeah, you take sometimes. it with you. <laughs> and and in this, like large scale brokerages, that's typically more the case is where people will exit. And that non-compete thing that they're still working on there could have a significant impact to large scale brokerages in the future. Right. Something I would consider here. But the the this consolidation, I it it really blows my mind at how like I think this is obviously the market's at a bottom. You're getting a good value here. But I think a lot of my questions are the same as Basco Majors, Susquehanna analyst, uh are where are the disenergies? Yeah. <laughs> When you start combining these two huge groups of people that are, have been competing for the same business, what does that mean? 
And I think a lot of the discourse around it so far has been in that technology and the unknown of the combination of yeah. technology, right? We see a lot of the discourse on LinkedIn going on right now where you have folks from Coyote saying, hey, like we're people first, we are person to person. Mm -hmm. And RxO is by nature, they've built their brokerage on a decent piece of tech and mm -hmm. doing things in a very automated process. Yeah. So I think that leaves a lot of folks who are coming from Coyote wondering like, am I relevant? Am I necessary <laughs> in this new RxO ecosystem? And that's a scary place to be. It's always scary when you have that kind of like merger situation or somebody gets bought. Like that's, there's always a bit of nerves there and, and time will tell on that aspect. I think redundancy is something they talked about. Obviously that puts a lot of fear into the existing people that are there. Uh, but, you know, on the positive side of things, the reason that this makes sense, you know, when you get to scale like that, you now have access to a significant amount of shippers. So that helps you talk to carriers and get in the door there more easily. Mm -hmm. And you have a significant amount of carriers <laughs> that helps you deal with the shippers needs more effectively as well. So your growth actually does help you scale, like scale yeah. creates scale here. And it makes your day to day easier in theory. The one people who are really happy about this was Wall Street. The yeah, investors. They loved it. 21.9% <laughs> surge on RxO stock. Yeah. Wild to see. I, you know, <laughs> I, I, I'll leave the commentary on Wall Street to an investment side analyst uh, for sure. We'll leave it to Tony when he comes back. Yeah, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll leave that to him, even though I am a finance geek as well. Um, so I want to progress into the weather component of the discussion. The today. real geeky things. Yeah. Today. So, and, and of course, why are we talking about weather on a freight show? Because it matters and because weather impacts freight. And, and weather has been the most significant disruptor to transportation markets over the last several years, excluding COVID. Yeah. <laughs> like, and without, we had a double whammy with one because yeah. we were in the middle of a COVID year when we had the big, t deep Texas freeze that shut things down for two weeks. The very first chart I'm going to bring up here, Kaylee, before I want to I want to break this one down, because this one, I think I even saw on our website, somebody criticized us for not talking about this in the context of weather. Uh, I Absolute false. Uh, I <laughs> totally <laughs> talked about this because this is fascinating to me. So what you're looking at is a chart of OTVI. Outbound tender volume index for 2021, the COVID pandemic peak year, if you will. You see that big rise in demand there in middle of 2020. Mm -hmm. um, and tender rejection rates, of course, spiking above that 20% threshold that I talked about. If you look, if, again, I love this chart because it actually helps us understand that there was a moment during the pandemic, things were evening out. Yep. Demand had fallen out of December. December wasn't that robust from a demand side in 2020. January actually was the most disappointing. January 2021 was very soft and we were still in the pandemic. And in the throes of spending, we had yeah. just, I think, gotten second or second COVID stimulus yeah. checks. Yeah, December 31st was the second stimulus check but after April uh, that really shot things off. Um, and so it really looked like things were, were smoothing out from a shipping standpoint. Mm -hmm. Texas, if you recall, there was this huge in the weather and I want your commentary <laughs> on this. Polar vortex. Uh, every time cold weather, I need a bell, like I need like a, like a ding south. ding buzzword yeah. bell. Every time cold weather invades the south, we call it a polar vortex for some reason. And it, this was pretty cold weather. It destroyed the power grid in Texas, which was uh, <laughs> kind of one of I w I w I'm going to say that it's a highlight, but yeah. it wasn't like a highlight in a positive mm -hmm. thing. It was one of the hallmarks yeah. of of that event was the fact that it showed how vulnerable Texas as mm -hmm. a state was from an infrastructure perspective. And I think that it really freaked a lot of people out because mm -hmm. it highlighted that weakness in yeah. the great state of Texas, right? And like my parents live in Texas. I hearken my home back to Texas now. I can still be critical of Texas and say that it was not a good time <laughs> no. for the state. It showed weakness in the infrastructure. It showed weakness of the government. And it showed a really big vulnerability, again, of the freight space to these weather events. And this was, of course, anomalous. And people call it like a once in a hundred year freeze. But this is something that quite literally had never been seen to that degree. And for that extended period, period of time, which was part of the problem. Yeah. And I think people want to discount this. It was cold air. Yes. Like, yes, it was cold air. It was really cold air. It was cold air. You had precipitation mm -hmm. on the front end of it, mm -hmm. which led to a bigger freeze. But the bigger issue was the fact that that cold air was in place for so long, you never mm -hmm. got a chance to thaw out. Right. And 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 so, I mean, speak, speak to this component of it, because I mean, the, the reason that we saw the tender volume index really recover uh, was because the vulnerability of Texas's power grid shut down shipping operations. Correct. In a time where shippers were 
still not, they did not have full capacity for inventory. They were, they were selling more than they were buying. Mm -hmm. uh, they weren't, the supply chain issues across the ocean were still an issue. So coming across the, the country, you had all these networks simultaneously shut down mm -hmm. in the middle of the country at a time when they still didn't have enough. So what it did was it created a kind of a panic. Right. So shippers were starting to settle down emotionally from this trauma of COVID. And, and then, then got smacked again. <laughs> all of a sudden, look at that rise in OTVI, like so fast. I mean, you're talking about a week, a week and a half, two weeks, yep. tender volumes just shoot up simultaneously across the board. This is multiple shippers, by the way. This is thousands of shippers all doing the same thing all at once because they couldn't get their freight. Why do you think, like, you know, it's not like cold air had never happened in right. Texas before. Why was this one? And why should we consider it? Because we just had another cold weather event this year. Yeah. Why is cold weather such a, an important thing to monitor for uh, transportation networks? So it it goes into the next topic, which we're going to hit on hurricanes, mm -hmm. but it's that opposite side of the spectrum, right? Cold weather, as I mentioned, really highlights people's vulnerabilities mm -hmm. and it highlights it for an extended period of time. Mm -hmm. Same thing with heat waves, same thing with any type of climatological event that happens on a scale that is longer mm -hmm. than a couple hours to like two days. Mm -hmm. When you have an anomalous cold weather event like this, you saw the effects mm -hmm. lasted for two plus weeks. And then down the road, the ripple effects were still being felt mm -hmm. on a pretty large scale. Same right. thing with hurricanes. And then you see it flip around in the freight markets because not necessarily as much as you do with hurricanes and hurricane mm -hmm. relief. You still had people who were needing repairs to homes and infrastructure to recover. If you think about it from a home space, you had people who had pipes burst and then you have to start looking at fixing your building materials and replacing your carpets and things like that. Yeah. It's consumables that relate to the freight market pretty heavily mm -hmm. and you see it extended for a longer period of time because those things aren't quick fixes. Right. And it's not like the weather warms back up and then all of a sudden everything's fine. Your house right. didn't get destroyed. You, you know, your car didn't sit stagnant for so long and you can't make those repairs, things like that. Right. And then of course the loss of operating time. Right. You know, you, you're, you're talking about these docks that nobody was reporting to. Right. You know, uh, COVID was one thing <laughs> where people couldn't go into a, uh, you know, to work. But this was another where they literally couldn't get there. Yeah. There was no power to generate any kind of movement or anything like that. So you just, you were stuck. Well, and the other thing about that too is mm -hmm. that I think really makes a big difference when we talk about weather is geographical and cultural differences that are used to dealing with this type of stuff, right? Like you think about cold air and anomalous cold air. For folks in the Northern parts of the country, you know, Midwest, Chicago, even the Northeast, they're used to dealing they with it. They have infrastructure this. for they it. They have infrastructure yeah. for it. Exactly. They're used to dealing with it. Mm -hmm. You get this extended period of anomalously cold air down in the South, nobody knows what to do. We joke around about it, but that is like, that <laughs> right. is actual reality is that you don't know what to do and you just don't have the ability to compensate. Yeah. I think Atlanta had a nice storm a few years back that, I mean, I, actually it was almost a decade ago. I think it was uh, 2014. Yeah. It yeah. It yeah. Was, oh my God. Time. There we go. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And it was a nationwide joke that Atlanta couldn't handle two inches of snow. But and it's true. It's real. It's couldn't. real. There's a bunch of hills and not a lot of salt trucks. No, absolutely not. So, All right, let's, let's move on. Yeah, let's get down. We talked about cold weather. I want to talk about the warm weather stuff. Now, yeah. this year is supposed to be, it's forecasted to have a significant amount of hurricanes right. and tropical activity. These can be completely devastating to transportation networks. And right. one of the things that happened in 2017, we were in a very similar situation in the freight market transportation environment. Mm -hmm. Everybody had kind of been lulled to sleep. Uh, by a very soft demand side environment. Industrial recession, not a lot of freight disruption going on. Harvey hits in 2017. And it basically was the catalyst for what became a huge, long extended period of, of market tightness. Exactly. And that was met, of course, by, again, that extended mm -hmm. period of time of recovery that was necessary in the Houston mm -hmm. area. And really quickly, before we touch on this, I want to I wanna address something that I've seen and heard a lot in conversation of the freight markets right mm -hmm. now. People are talking about an anomalous hurricane season in a positive light to bring back life to the freight market. <laughs> And I, I get it, but I also want, want to make sure that we, we level set with this. Having a lot of destructive hurricanes is not a good thing. No, it's a bad it's solution a very to bad the problem thing. of a very bad soft thing. market. Yeah. Exactly. It causes destruction. It causes disruption. It causes loss of life. It causes impacts to mm -hmm. folks who are oftentimes low income and don't have those resources to recover. So let's level set with that. Uh, an active hurricane season is not a great thing. We don't want 100%. to encourage that. And we are not, we Go. don't want to bank a freight recovery on that. Yeah. <laughs> 
Donnie Gilbert uh, used to get like anybody that's curious needs to go through a disaster zone yes. once and One come back from that feeling remotely okay about anything. It will absolutely yeah. pull you back into perspective. <laughs> yeah. That being said, let's pull up our chart on the 2024 Atlanta hurricane season outlook because as you mentioned, mm -hmm. it is expected to be a more active year. Mm -hmm. uh, NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the World Meteorological Organization forecasting 85% chance of above normal activity for the year, 10% chance of near normal to 5% below normal. We're predicting right now 17 to 25 named storms. Eight to 13 of those are expected to be hurricanes. Four to seven major hurricanes. That's category three or above. So far this year, we've actually only seen one really significant instance of tropical activity. A couple of weeks ago. Yeah, we a couple had weeks ago. Gulf of Mexico, right? Alberto, mm -hmm. right. That's name number one on our list. And if we can pull that one up, we can see, of course, WMO always going ahead and giving us out that list. Mm -hmm. Tony is actually on the list. This year. So if we get all the way down to T, <laughs> okay. we'll have somebody to blame. But we can talk a little bit about why this is forecast to be a pretty active season. And we actually have a building La Nina, which is a bigger ah. climate circulation that involves sea surface temperatures on the Pacific side of the ocean. That influences the way that the jet stream works across mm -hmm. the larger part of the United States. What it does is it turns your westerly winds to focus a little bit more into the Gulf and into the East Coast, that lower East Coast. So your wind profile is more supportive of bringing the tropical activity out from the open ocean and onto the coastline. And then once it moves over there, once you get that thunderstorm initiation, sea surface temperatures across the Atlantic and the Gulf of Mexico off of the charts right now, some places recording actual measured temperature in like the mid nineties across the Florida Keys. Yeah, I, I mid that hotter than bath water. Yeah, hotter <laughs> than your average bath water. And and of course, the average temperature for a hurricane to be formed is eighty degrees. Yes, and and that's that's the requirement, right? Right. And then so, anything above that is basically just gravy for a yeah. hurricane to just oh, it's I'm just, thriving here. I'm just thriving. You can think of a hurricane as just a giant combustion engine yeah. in the sky um, because all it does is I love that analogy. And produce heat at <laughs> yeah. the very top. And it's just it's just a giant cyclical engine. Um, but we can relate this back to freight really quickly, talking about some of our most impactful hurricanes from the last couple of years. We'll start off with Michael because this was one that had significant impacts that still continually last. Mm -hmm. And I want to touch on this because it made landfall in the Big Bend of Florida, Apalachicola, as a major storm. It was a Cat 5. It was, was a cat yeah. five, not necessarily when it made landfall, like right before it did, mm. the wind measurements were just shy of a cat five. It's still a big point of contention across <laughs> the meteorology society, but it made landfall and it's still impactful. If you go down to Apalachicola, the big bend that's down there, there's no recovery still. There's a $25 billion estimated damage mm -hmm. from, from Hurricane Michael. We did not see a strong impact from Hurricane Michael. If we want to pull up this chart of tender rejection rates uh, for that year, this is 2018. That market was already, it was coming out of a very tight environment cycle uh, that started back in 2017. But if you look at the little call out there, that's when Michael hit for the, this is outbound tender rejection rates for the state of Florida. Um, and it really you know, yes, it had a little bit of disruption, but if you look at OTRI USA, it didn't have a huge impact nationally. And that's that's the takeaway for me here is that this one hit a pretty low population area. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Not a, not a lot of freight moving out there. And not a lot of infrastructure damage right. relative. $25 billion is astronomical, but right. not a ton of, you know, I guess this this type of damage w was more economic than it right. was Oh, like impactful, impactful right let's and so really quickly because we only have a couple minutes left i want to talk about ida because this one was impactful mm -hmm. We've got its track pulled up there and that one impacted louisiana which of course was hit yep. by hurricane katrina in louisiana you have several points of infrastructure you've mm -hmm. got oil you've got natural gas yep. you've got uh, uh energy resources like that but it's also a pretty big port down there yeah the port of uh new orleans it of course came across lake charles i believe mm -hmm. right um and anything that inches closer to houston to me, like you've got that oil and gas, that industrial component. There's right. a ton of freight that comes through the port of Houston, even though it's not necessarily in the scale of Los Angeles, uh, Long Beach. But this one did have, I think it was actually less than Michael or no. Yeah, no, it was significantly more. I'm sorry. $75 billion uh, in Lu and 18 billion in Louisiana. The rest Whoa. of it was dispersed. Mm -hmm. And I think the big uh, takeaway for me is that 20 billion of it was in the Northeast. 
Exactly. <laughs> How wild is that to see yeah. that you have impacts from hurricanes all the way up? We didn't even have time to get into Sandy, which yeah. if we had had freight waves data back yeah. then, like it would have been crazy to watch how that mm -hmm. impacted the freight markets there. But it's something with eyes, man. Yeah. Ida, no. <laughs> Irma. <laughs> yes. Th real quick. The eyes. Why are the eyes so impactful? I got to say, I, I, this is all just Katrina is close to an eye. Harvey. I think that mm -hmm. middle, middle of the yeah. alphabet, mm -hmm. I think, gets worse just because you're in like the peak of summer, yeah. peak sea surface temperature. Everything's right. You're in the middle of the alphabet. It. It yeah. tends to be in August. Correlation, causation, maybe not the same, but yeah. that's what I'm relating it they, to. They've been hitting right around the end of August, Labor Day. That yeah. seems to be kind of a... Just the middle of the season. Big, like, I know, what is it, peaks is September 15th on average? Yeah, but that's that's just the exact middle of climatological yeah. hurricane okay. season. So hopefully this satisfied your weather person curiosity for the day. <sighs> yes, very much so. And thank you, Kaylee Nix, for filling in for Tony Moley, who, who of course... We lost the bet. He's only one Guinness deep right now. Oh, man. It's somewhat disappointing. I'm going to be honest with you. Well, thanks again, and hopefully this was informative. Watch out this year for...